Right, thanks very, very much indeed for that. That was uh, that was a tour de force, that was. Uh, very interesting indeed. Right, um, okay, well, um, we have something here which is uh, beyond Einstein, beyond Einstein's gravitation. Let me throw the, uh, let me throw the um, meeting open to uh, questions for this. Anyone uh, like to kick things off and, uh, and, uh, and ask if what he's on about there? Well, may I ask you, did anybody understand it? Mostly. <laughs> it was my impression that, that you don't really need to use uh, tensors to understand uh, relativity with mass and gravity, that it's it's all done fine with uh, what, I, what I guess is um, standard relativity, not general relativity, right? Yes, well, um, I think I think you need the tensor ex. Well, I, I think Einstein used the tensor explanation because he because he wished to show that uh, you got a distortion of space and time in in all four dimensions. I think that's why he used them. Uh, so but, I was just trying to think about yeah. it with, with John's work because he's also working in at least four dimensions, right? And he's also involving mass and uh, relativity. But no, but no uh, tensors, as far as I know. My, the way I prefer to do mathematics is work rather than, as you saw there, rather than work out the equations for the field equations, work out the equations for the acceleration due to gravity and then calculate it out, then you can plot out the field equations. That's the way I prefer to operate, but um, then again, I'm a physicist. Well, the, I guess one of the big things is in Einstein, they, when they talk about Einstein's theory, they're talking about a photon, that space is curving, right? And if you think of the acceleration on a photon, then it's not space that's curving, it's the photon, which is deviating from a straight line. And those are two well, yeah, I mean, you get down to at some stage you have to then say either you're talking about Einstein um, relativistic space or whether you're talking about Newtonian space and most of us are quite familiar with the three independent directions with time being independent we very rarely have do we have to come across a situation where the two start interfering with each other photons so using the Newtonian terminology, photons are bent going around when they come near a, a massive object. Using the relativistic um, interpretation, then they are traveling in a straight line. And as I mentioned before, the Einstein's theories of relativity are about when the, when the speed of constant, when the speed of light is constant for all observers and is of a finite value, his work enables people to calculate the effects that can be obtained uh, by an observer at a different position. That's what it's about. That's so, why so, the, so we have to define a, a straight line as the direction that, that light goes? Uh, well, the straight line is usually defined as the shortest distance between two points. Mm -hmm. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, it's the, what we accept as uh, <clears throat> just a straight line. But in uh, relativistic mechanics, where mass and the curvature of mass curving space time is due to the change in the wavelength of the photons. Uh, Can I in, come in on that? Can I come in yeah. on that and, and uh, ask you w whether or not that distortion in space-time in Einsteinian view or the change in the relative scale of rulers in clocks, in your view, is equivalent? Yes, they are the same. In other words, whatever. Okay, time is more measured by the... Uh, the oscillation, the frequency of the oscillation that develop, that generates the photon, but it essentially, uh, <clears throat> it is measured by the, uh, the change of the photon, the changes to the wavelength of the photon. So these are two views, in a sense, of the same thing. Einsteinian, except the approximation, which Einstein's only looking at the first two terms in the Koronik expansion of the thing, then taking that as a given, that, 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 that for small gravitational fields, then 
Einsteinian or your view, uh, as you're explaining, in terms of changes in rulers and clocks is exactly equivalent. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Good. But, but, it's, beyond... but it's, not, it's not correct when you get to high masses. But when you get to high masses or you get to high fields, and of course, they, one could have deviations in the fact that you take more terms in the current expansion. And Einstein, as he stated in his initial papers, did not. He was stating that it's an approximation. Is that correct? Well, he, he was stating, he was stating, well, he, yeah, he was stating he was using approximations. And he said so. And that's, yeah. yeah I don't know whether, Good I man. don't know whether, I don't Good know man. whether you can, you can see yeah. up here. I've seen him before, yeah. No, that's okay. right. And he says so. No, he that's says so. Perfect. In the order of small quantities. Yeah. And then you so much, I'm sorry. I, I was going to use, well, no, I'll use it anyway. Bullshit. <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> well, that earlier slide I showed of um, where the experts got it wrong. Um, I have, uh, you have to ask them why they got it. And I think the biggest thing I've well, it, is... It's not a question of being wrong, is it? it what, what are you doing? You take an approximation and then on the basis of taking that on board, you're then extrapolating on the basis of that approximation. Now, that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Mm -hmm. but one has to be realized that one is extrapolating on the basis of something that's an approximation. And you've pointed that out beautifully in my view. Yeah, yeah, you have, you know, it, look, Einstein's work is for, for, the, for the world around us, uh, <clears throat> Einstein was exactly correct. I mean, his work was exact. <clears throat> well, if you call, call measurements of uh, you know, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, uh, all of that, uh, Einstein's equal calculations work fabulously well. So, well, there is no need to change anything that he did. It becomes a different situation when you want to extend that from to R equals alpha or you know, a few alpha, then the approximations no longer apply and you can't use his theorem. You can't use his theory and all. Now, at this stage, the only difference that makes is to whether that structure in, in M87, whether it was a black hole or whether it was the torus that I'm predicting. Uh, that's the first difference, although when we get round to discussing the uh, overall properties of the universe, you'll find that the, because uh, this is when, when, when red shifts become one and two and three, uh, it becomes an entirely different situation and it gives the universe an entirely different appearance. So for all all earthly matters, uh, that my work was just no different from what Einstein has done. Uh, and uh, it, you've got to get to the, uh, you've got to get to cosmology itself before it starts to make a difference. You have a relationship between the redshift and how close the photons come to a large mass. Is that right? Yes. They right. You put the data from Pioneer 6 into that equation and tested it. There's a uh, Pioneer 6 when it went behind the sun. Um, as, it got, as the photon got closer and closer to the sun, there were more and more redshifted. And NASA have released the redshift and how far it was from the sun. Could you put that data in and test your equation? Well, you can, yes. Um, I would say they would match. Good man, Lyndon. That's a good. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, I mean there are there are. I, I, I've got the. I, I have the data. It's easy to find. Mm. I think. But, but I think it would be a nice way of testing it, apart mm -hmm. from relativity. Like I said, um, that the may from the surface of the sun. Um, Einstein's calculate or determined that the uh, change of frequency was related to the directly to the redshift of the sun, and he, I get the same calculations as he gets. So yes, it, it would be a way of doing it, but I would be exceedingly surprised if they got a different answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, because they've already they've already shown directly that the um, 
that the frequency of oscillations on the sun as determined by the frequency of the ionization emissions and probably use helium and a whole lot of others may all vary by that uh, what 2.1 times 10 to the minus six and that is what has been determined that has been determined from the uh, uh, from the center from the surface of the sun and uh, you saw there the derivations of the mercury the red shift from mercury and uh, earth uh, were both required to get the it's precession just because of it's nice updated from a completely different approach. But the same. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, the actual it, data there. It, it, put it nice this way: there, 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 there are quite a few equations there that I put a certain part of my anatomy on the line. If anyone wants want to go and check them, but um, as far as I'm concerned, they will be okay. Can I ask a question, John? Certainly. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, Viv, um, so thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, uh, this, I, I, I don't know how well posed this question is, um, but in the consensus view um, amongst the experts, the LIGO data on gravitational radiation, um, the standard explanation for the, uh, their, 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 their observational results is is coalescing black holes in your scenario is there any um, no rival candidate for the explanation yeah, the, 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 well you, you saw with those with you saw with those um, field equations uh, the the, the um, diagrams i had up once you get away from i mean it's, it's just the mass that causes it it's not the, not the fact that it's a black hole, it is sheer the mass. And as long as uh, the, the masses are the same, you will get the same result. It's got nothing to do with a black hole. It's just their mass. It's just that it, they uh, have taken well, what, the, the mass of these annual... The, ma the, mass of the, two, the mass of the two colliding bodies is what causes okay, right. the... So, not, but, black, not the fact that they are black holes. No, no, I understand. But, but I mean, so the scenario is that this is still, that this is still evidence of collisions of massive bodies, but your, yes. but in your scenario, obviously the candidates for those massive bodies are not black holes because for the reasons you've given very, very clearly and succinctly, um, you know, in your scenario where you are treating Einstein's, um, the derivation that Einstein said, you know, was based on approximation as just that and not as an exact solution. There is no scope for black holes because of this issue about the precession and the yes, but that's the correct. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it's just the mass, and you've seen that once you get away from you know, R equals five alpha, for example, uh, there's very very little difference between the three equations. So, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that, that was the slide. that I think for me was the most interesting slide in your entire talk was the you know the diagram where you just showed how. Uh, what was it? Two parts in a billion? I forget. At the, you know, at the, oh, and then the, uh, the, the difference. The difference between the, the, the Newtonian uh, spark child and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, other theory that differed. Yeah, that was very interesting. It, it is. That's that's Mike, isn't it? Sorry, Mike. I keep getting you wrong because you're a black hole there yourself. But um, but, sorry about that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but it's my problem. Sorry, not yours. What, what am I getting wrong? I'm sure I'm getting a great deal wrong. But... You're not getting anything wrong in my view, uh, but no, no, abs abs absolutely correct. But 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 I think coming back to what you're saying just there, I don't think there's really much difference between what's happening in the Einsteinian view and in, in that respect, and 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 Viv's view. You're talking about different interpretations. He's looking in terms of distortion of space time. Um, Viv's looking in terms of the relative change in rulers and clocks, which you know, these two things are the same oh. physics. And if you're looking at the physics, your interpretation of the physics may be different here. But at the, at the level of the Einstein approximation, the first two terms in the, in, in the Bokorin expansion, they are the same. It's when yeah. you come to higher math terms that they're different. Yes, yeah, so when you go to second order, that's the when thing. When you go to second order, then you're, you're moving off that, exactly. Yeah, I, I take your general methodological point about the, the, these things usually showing up at second order. The, the hidden presuppositions of the experts uh, you know, uh -huh. coming unstuck when you look at uh, second order and higher derivatives that that was a very interesting point it is yeah. it is yeah. and, and that's yeah. where we have to go next in terms of experiment 
I would just like to, just to reinforce that, I'm just going to share uh, the screen for a minute and just point out and go back to this one here where he points out the dx equals 1 minus alpha over r over 2r. Well, as I pointed out to you earlier, alpha over 2r was z. It is the red ship, so they are essentially, I am saying this, they are, my, my, I'm saying my work is the same as his. I mean, I derive the same expression for g. Well, I don't derive one, minus 1 plus alpha over r. I derive e to the alpha over r which is the same thing you know, when r is much much short when r is much much greater than alpha yeah so yeah when r is much much greater than alpha anyway i just wanted to give make sure you got the message that yes he was using redshift he didn't say so but alpha over 2r is, red, is the first approximation of redshift which is exceedingly good for anything that we've observed uh, even that orbit of star S2 around um, Sagittarius A, you'll still get the same out that the, the alpha is not my, that that slide was just indicated in, to show that uh, Einstein derived alpha, alpha over 2R is redshift. Hey, Vib, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, yes. Chandra, Chandra. Uh, would you differentiate between the cosmological redshift and this redshift Z that you are saying? Do you understand my question? No. So, cosmological uh, redshift, okay, which relates to so-called expanding universe and your derivation of redshift. Well, my, my definition for redshift was uh, lambda uh, lambda lambda r minus lambda zero over lambda zero. This is purely redshift of the emission from atoms and molecules. Oh, uh, it's well, all the radiation, all the radiation. Can I help? Can I help yeah. I think I think what um, Chandra is talking about, Viv, is your derivation of the redshift is due to concentric shells of gravitation based on wherever you happen to be, where the observer happens to be. If you explain that, I think you'll, I think Chandra will get what you're talking about. Well, that derivation, that uh, concentric uh, mass was in relation to the whole, the universe at, at large. Yeah. Uh, which I, mean, I haven't, I haven't discussed that yet. The, I mean, the redshift is, is still the same. I mean, redshift is redshift, but it has different has different effects, uh, and depending whether it's space inside matter or uh, space outside matter. Uh, I'm not quite sure how what is meant by trying to relate it to atoms. I mean, the atoms are the ones that the electrons in atoms are the ones that are emitting the photons that are detected as being redshift. Uh, atoms will move when I should point out that in local mass. Now, if you are close to the Earth's surface of the sun, uh, you will not make, make you will not. There will be no difference in your measurement of the speed of light uh, than is if you're way outside the uh, beyond the Mercury <coughs> beyond. Um, Pluto's orbit or beyond um, Nep Neptune's orbit. It makes no difference. You, wherever you are and whatever velocity you have, you will, compared to anything else, you will always measure the speed of light as whatever it is defined as 2.997, etc. Uh, that, that measurement will never change for where you are as the observer. However, what will, what will change is the, when a photon is emitted from a high gravitational strength field and detected at a low gravitational strength field, the, the person at the low gravitational, or the observer at the low gravitational strength field will detect the photons, their frequency of photons as being uh, longer 
then the uh, then the same you know, like the emission of uh, sodium line, sodium alpha line, or something like that. A comparison between the sodium line emitted at uh, in a high strength field measured uh, and observed in a low strength field and the same line emitted in the low strength gravitational field, the frequency of the, uh, of the sodium line or will be less in, as measured in the low gravitational field. That's okay. I don't know whether that was confusing or not, but that the whole idea is that it's the redshift of photons which reduces the time, which reduces the frequency, which makes the time difference between high redshift and low redshift, uh, sorry, high gravitational and low gravitational fields. Yeah. Sorry. Can I come back? To that? Say oh, one of the yeah. many things I learned from the talk was thinking about observations from Earth as an Earthling and observations from Saturn as a Saturnian. But in fact, the, the, that in fact, the, the, be, because you're looking at different ruler and clock scales, it's that what you measure in terms of that precession is different from those different scales because one's looking yeah. for a different scale of space and time. And I think yes. that's a very beautiful thing that you brought out with your whole presentation that one needs to think about and one needs to realize these things are not as measured on earth absolute or as measured no. on Saturn absolute but there's no. a scale of that motion as you move to that measurement of precession as you move between Saturn and earth and anywhere in between and I think that's very beautiful Viv and very nicely done thank so you. thank you for that that was uh, for me an insight which I hadn't had before but which was, as you said it, as clear as daylight. So thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. One of the uh, questions that I was wondering about when you showed the graphic between the different three metrics is that it's always bothered me that if gravity was stronger than inverse square and it could distort space-time asymptotically, does, how does that not violate the conservation of energy? Yes, well, there are so many things wrong with black holes that uh, it's hard to believe that, that people accept them. That they do uh, and I think one of the reasons they accept them is because the mathematics they use are so complex that uh, <laughs> like I said did you want to really want to work through pages and pages that they use for every solution I don't think so and and so somebody somewhere along the line picked the wrong one they picked, picked the wrong approximation and they've been stuck with it ever since so what about the very simple situation, observing from the center of the sun? And the only thing is the sun, Mercury, and a very, very distant star that you can observe from the sun, which has no gravitational effect. Is there a precession? Well, I'll go back to this slide. Oops, let me get it up. And we'll go back to this one. And basically, yeah. in, in, in the center of the sun, and if you, if you were to plot the gravitational field in the center of the sun, it would start out uh, not as the strongest gravitational field. Would, would, it would be something like this. You have a strongest gravitational field somewhere near the middle, but the center of the sun would have no gravity associated with it. Although actually measuring zero gravitational field would be rather difficult. But yes, the center right, of the sun. What's, what's, center the, of the, what's the observation of Mercury from the viewpoint of the center of the sun? Well, that goes back to... So we have this situation here. From the center, well, the, the surface of the sun, it's the redshift is... 2.1 times 10 to, as measured, well, to infinity, as measured, is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 6. Mercury is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 8. So, so what was your question again? That, that you, do, you do get in a, a precession because of the gravitational effects yes. on the orbit. Y yes, yes. It's, that, not, that's, it's that's, not caused by your observing it from Earth. If you were at the center of the sun and observing mercury it would still have a precession 
Uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, ba basically, if you go back to what's this equation that I... If you go back to this equation... No, 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 no. Yeah, well, that, well, that will that, go back to this equation. And basically, it means that if you're orbiting, if you were observing Mercury from Mercury, oh, sorry, if you're observing Mercury from Mercury, uh, you would not, according to this, you would not get a, you would not observe a, um, a precession. But if you're observing it from under Mercury's orbit, you would actually see it regress. Regress. Yeah. That's according to that equation. So as you get further away, your precession arc seems to be increasing, right? Uh, yes, as you, as you get further away, the measured precess, precession will increase, yes. And from the center of the sun, it's actually a negative precession. Well, well you, you would, and once you get inside Mercury's orbit, I think you would see Mercury orbit regress, go in the opposite direction. And it would be, it would be relatively high at the center of the sun. You would observe, um, you would observe Mercury's orbit regressing. And from the center of the sun, it would probably be about that. But it sort of becomes an academic question that nobody's going to get remotely close to the center of the sun to see it. No, uh, I was just observe. making sure that it wasn't a side effect of the observation of the Earth. Oh, no. It was causing it, the, the precession. No, 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 is, no, no, no. The, the precession that. exists. That, uh, it, it, all this table shows is that wherever you are, you will get a different value for that precession. And it suggests that if you go inside Mercury's orbit, you will actually see its orbit regress. Mm -hmm. The thing is that what you're doing is you're looking at different scales of rulers and clocks. Right. So, so, yeah. so your, scale of, your scale of length and your scale of time is varying as you move in on the gravitation. And, and that means that what you observe is different with respect to your own ruler and your own clock. And, uh, and what yeah. we, no, so you, but the whole thing is that, yes, that precession of Mercury is a very real effect. A change, of, change in uh, orbital position is a very real effect. Uh, the extent of that effect depends upon from where you observe it. And it would suggest that if you observe it from under Mercury's orbit, you will actually see it regress. So the, observing it from very far away from the, from the sun, its precession is going the one way, but from the center of the sun, it's actually processing the other way. They, yes, um, once, once you get inside Mercury's orbit, it's, regre it's regressing. I think the point is there's no absolute precession of Mercury. What no, there is, no, no. There, there is a difference in observation. It's a question of perspective. And your perspective depends on where you are in terms of gravitation, where you are in terms of motion. And that was always yes. what Mercury was really about. Yes, that's as I, as I mentioned earlier, every observation uh, ma made from different positions uh, gives a gives a different result. And this uh, is the problem. Of it. Uh, suppose I oh. am riding on a uh, satellite, almost perpendicular to the plane of orbits of all the planets, which is basically somewhat similar plane. And I'm vertically going up from this planetary orbiting plane on a satellite way up. And if I'm looking at now the orbit of Mercury, okay, would yeah. I be the same precession of its orbit? No, because when you move when you're moving away from the sun, you get this redshift effect. Ah. Okay, so the redshift changes. So Z or you're talking about about, about this, uh, that changes. And that's why you'll see a different um, different precession. So if you the, the absolute precession as viewed from uh, the observer, this value being zero, is this 90 arc seconds per century. That's the absolute precession. 
all the rest of it is, uh, but uh, all the rest of them are relative to the observer. And wherever you are, re wherever the observer is, we'll get different answers. Okay. And so that's the, the way you calculate the it. Less precision will be still same if I am uh, way up from the planetary rotation plane, uh, very far from the sun. Yes. Yes, like I say, uh, as, as well as the, having to take this into account, uh, even if you've got everything else right and you just move further away, you still have this change, and it is this change that will affect uh, affects these results, as well as this change. But it is is going to be a, some minimum which is never going to change. It's kind of can the precision completely zero if I'm away from the sun perpendicular to the plane of orbits of all the planets? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so the, the thing about relativity, of course, what this doesn't take into account is the, uh, the relativistic, is the uh, special relativity corrections corrections for the speed of the planet. Uh, so I haven't taken those into consideration because these outer planets will move slower than Earth. Uh, but I've been using it in terms of uh, Earth time. Mm -hmm. there, will, there, there will be a slight adjustment to those. Uh, but if you're referring to Earth, if you adjust it back to Earth time, you'll get these values. It's actually quite an interesting. Uh, <laughs> when you get to you know, these very small redshift changes, when you're talking about 10 to the minus 8 and, and that sort of thing, uh, over a while these do add up a little bit. And uh, trying, try, I did try at one stage, to, oh, I, I did succeed, but I thought it was too complex to show that by introducing the special relativity changes when you are um, communicating between the uh, between the uh, orbits around the different planets it's it, it's not it's not just the redshift time it, it's not just the redshift time difference and the um, rotational speed difference um, yeah it gets it, it gets it needs a few more pages and a lot more pressing of a Okay. keys on the calculator that I've done so far. Well, 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 obviously you've got the gravitational redshift, which is due to potential, but you also have the relative velocity redshift, which is different. You've got Mercury going zzz, and you've got the Earth going like this, and there's a velocity between them, and that's an extra yeah, no. observation. No. You do that is numerical modeling, and you know, by the time you finish all that, the fact that you have a sort of one part in a thousand, which is the difference between Einstein and you, is probably in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe. Uh, the thing to do, the thing to do that you don't have to, when you're measuring uh, in this particular situation, we're not concerned about time on Mercury. We couldn't care less about that. Let the Mercurians worry about that. And the <laughs> Earthlings will worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> only one ruler and clock at a time. Good for you. Quite yeah, we only have to worry about Earth, <laughs> Earth clock. And so the relativistic redshift, the uh, special relativity time difference due to Earth's motion, which is not insignificant, by the way. No, it's quite large. Yeah. It's quite large. Uh, we don't have to worry about it because we are making those observations on Earth. Yeah, that's right, Yeah. Anyway, okay. this, is very, this is very cool indeed, Biff. Thank you very much indeed for all of that. Any more questions, gentlemen? Uh, right, gentlemen, well, it seems we've well and truly resumed our quesicle process. Um, I think we'll just uh, continue with this over Christmas and New Year, if everybody's still up for it. And, uh, um, and the... Arnie Ben's been doing some interesting things, so hopefully that will come up. There are other people who are uh, ready to talk as well. Um, Colin, you're one of them. I think you have some more things to talk about, for example. You're still there at the moment. So um, so we'll look forward to something, um, to um, resuming this next week. A any more like burning to... questions, though, before well, we finish? I, 
I'd only Thank like you. to say, I'd only like to say, John, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this. I feel much happier now. <laughs> I'm delighted. <laughs> Got it off my chest. Okay. Thanks, Viv. That was great. Thank Viv, you. John, thank you for a great, great uh, send-off, great kick-off to the new season. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you on board here as well. I'd like to talk to you soon as well. How are you doing?